Well, thanks everyone, and welcome again to Authors at Google, live in the San Francisco office. Uh, today we have Stephen Hall talking about his book, Wisdom, From Philosophy to Neuroscience. Uh, Award-winning science writer Stephen Hall examines ancient concepts of wisdom through the lens of modern brain science and, and, and neuroscience. Uh, breaking wisdom down to what Stephen refers to as the eight neural pillars, uh, Hall takes a fresh look at human qualities long associated with wisdom, including compassion, uh, emotional regulation, the ability to, to discern what's important, uh, and the skill of coping with uncertainty, and suggests that modern neuroscience is providing radical new insights about how these timeless virtues evolved. Uh, based in part on a 2007 article in the New York Times Magazine, um, which I strongly recommend looking up and reading. Uh, wisdom is also a meditation on the seeds of wisdom, uh, aspects of wisdom in everyday life, and the future of wisdom in our, in our complex society. Hall is a professor of journalism at Columbia and NYU, uh, and he actually has an article coming out a little later this month in National Geographic. Uh, so uh, be sure to check out, if you'd like to know more, his website, stephenshall.com, uh, where he has a, a, a nice new blog known as MindWise. So thanks again, and let's uh, welcome Stephen Hall to Google. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me here to, to talk about this. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how I got involved in this. Um, wisdom is obviously an immense topic. Um, and it's kind of difficult to talk about because it means so many different things to different people and the definition has changed over the course of history and the definition has been argued about uh, for the last 2,500 years. Um, and even as I'm beginning, I can imagine a kind of several pertinent questions running through your mind, uh, the most obvious of which is what exactly does he mean by wisdom and who the heck is this guy to be telling me about it? Those are both good questions, and I'm going to answer the second one first because, uh, A, it's easier, but B, it actually kind of tells you the story of how I got involved in this. Um, I'm not a philosopher. I hope that's obvious. Um, Lord knows I'm not a theologian. I was the only kid in my high school class who flunked the test on the Bible, which is not easy. I'm not a psychologist, and I'm certainly uh, not a neuroscientist. Uh, I'm a science writer. And for the last 25, 30 years, I've mostly written about very basic science. I write a lot about genetics. I write a lot about molecular biology. Uh, I write about uh, immunology. I've written histories of the creation of biotechnology, how the, uh, how the entire industry uh, was actually founded a few miles south of here in, in South San Francisco with Genentech. Um, I've written a book about uh, cancer immunotherapy. So it's been very basic science that's always kind of um, intrigued me. And then also the history and story behind these things. Uh, so then the question is, so uh, what in the world kind of attracted me to the topic of wisdom, which is very much unlike those other topics? Um, and the answer to that is it kind of began with the phone call that I received in the fall of 2006. Um, the call was from uh, my editor at the New York Times Magazine, a woman named Vera Titunic, who explained that the magazine was doing a special issue on the baby boomer generation getting old and what I like to contribute to it. Um, I'm not sure exactly what qualified me for the call, but I <laughs> suspect part of it was my uh, inclusion in that generation. Um, but in, in point of fact, I've actually, I did my very first cover story for the Times Magazine in 1981. So I've had a fairly steady association with the magazine for nearly 30 years, have worked at the magazine, have been the science editor of the magazine, um, and have done a, a, a number of stories. So I kind of think of it as a kind of home, and I'm always uh, delighted and kind of flattered when they uh, get in touch and ask me if I'd be interested in, in uh, doing something. So I said, did they have anything particular in mind? And uh, she said, yes, they had heard that there was research that had been conducted in wisdom. And would I be interested in, in writing about this? Um, and contrary to the what you might think because of the book that's sitting in front of you, my first reaction was my heart completely sank when I heard this because I thought, uh, there's no way this there's no way there could be any credible science that is associated with this, and there's no way research uh, could be uh, uh, could be credible. Um, 
uh, I can tell you this, but I didn't tell her that, but I, the whole idea of it, because it's such a nebulous idea, how would you define wisdom? Uh, how could you conduct empirical research on it? Uh, was kind of ridiculous. Um, and again, for the same reasons I just mentioned, I spent my whole career writing about hard science and in addition, the critical thinking that produces hard science and the notion that something as nebulous and fuzzy as wisdom could lend itself to empirical study uh, really struck me as preposterous. Fortunately, I didn't actually tell her that. <laughs> Uh, instead, I said uh, I would look into it, and she said, great, and she mentioned a couple of psychologists who had done some of this research, um, and when she mentioned it, I said, oh, that's interesting, and because it was a phone call, she didn't see me rolling my eyes as I said, that's interesting, um, and then I started gathering the research and started um, just kind of involving myself and immersing myself in this literature. So what was this literature? Well, it turns out, very interestingly, that in the 1970s, in the 1980s, um, there was a small group of psychologists, kind of inspired by Eric Erickson, who's a name you might recognize as one of the great 20th century American psychologists, um, who began a kind of formal study of wisdom. And Erickson had glancingly mentioned wisdom uh, very early on in his career, actually around 1950, um, as a kind of culminating stage of human development toward the end of life. Uh, and part of his definition was its reconciliation of two kind of opposite things, one of which was what he called ego integrity, which is kind of being settled in oneself uh, at that stage of life, and the disruption of contemplating one's mortality. So there are these two con uh, conflicting impulses going on toward the end of life, and wisdom uh, kind of manifested itself when you were able to reconcile these two things and continue uh, forward and be productive. Um, it also coincided, interestingly, with a, with a, a tangent from gerontology. Uh, for a lot of uh, gerontology and gerontological psychology up to that point, uh, people mostly studied mental decline and physical decline. Those were the things that were associated with aging. And in the 1970s, a group of psychologists said there must also be some positive things about aging. Why don't we go out and look for them? Um, there was a group at the University of Southern California uh, led by a, a pretty prominent gerontological psych a psychologist named James Barron, who kind of initiated a lot of this study. And it was one of his graduate students, a woman named Vivian Clayton, who lives in Berkeley, um, who did the first even faintly empirical studies of wisdom. This, they were published in 1975. Um, and as I learned, as I started familiarizing myself with this early history, the researchers who actually started looking at this were not flakes. They were very mainstream people in psychology. One of them uh, was a guy named Robert Sternberg, who is a professor at Yale University for 30 years, very um, well known for a theory of intelligence. And in fact, he then went into wisdom research because he uh, felt that the uh, intelligence as a theory was flawed because it didn't take into account certain aspects of human behavior that, that uh, didn't rise to the level of wisdom. So he actually used uh, uh, intelligence to get to wisdom. Um, he was a former president of the American Psychological Association, so he's very mainstream in that sense. Uh, and then there was a group based in Germany at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development, uh, led by Paul Baltus. They, too, had been studying aging I had an aging project in Berlin in the 1980s that morphed into the Berlin Wisdom Project because they became really intrigued by how, how elderly people were dealing with some of these issues and what constituted wisdom, how one acquired it, and how it developed. So these were not fringe figures. They were actually very interesting mainstream psychologists, probably well-established enough to take on this kind of crazy idea of wisdom uh, because there was a lot of obvious skepticism, much like I had. Um, Many of these people uh, came from a field known as uh, uh, lifespan developmental uh, psychology, which is a branch of psychology which studies changes in human development, thought, emotion over the course of the lifetime with the understanding that the times you live in, the uh, events that happen, the technologies that are available, everything that occurs during your lifetime has an impact on how you think and how you feel and how those qualities evolve and change over the course of a lifetime. I mean, it's sounds very obvious to us now, but in fact, so much psychology was based on very specific uh, time periods and, and sort of the present tense, so it took a much broader view of it. 
So anyway, this small group of researchers uh, started to design studies, and they began publishing studies uh, about wisdom, beginning again around 1975. And enough had been uh, published that in 1990, there was actually an academic anthology edited by Sternberg uh, entitled Wisdom. Um, so I got my hands on this book, and I started reading some of these uh, uh, articles. Um, and it really kind of explains how I got into this. A funny thing happened. Um, I really found myself fascinated by this very fuzzy topic. Um, again, most of the research I read and write about is, you know, involves uh, transcription factors and genetics and uh, the nuts and bolts of antigen antibody interaction. Very, very detailed uh, mechanistic explanations of how things work at a reductive level. Um, suddenly I was reading about life choices, moral decisions and moral judgment, uh, emotional resilience, uh, and resolving problems that often involved uh, these kind of timeless conflicts between the immediate impulse to satisfy ur one's urges and delaying those gratifications to get a larger goal on the one hand, or try to mediate the self-interest versus what would be of interest to a larger group of people, whether it's a family, a uh, congregation, a work group, whatever, whatever it is. Um, I found the reading incredibly stimulating, uh, in part because it did what all us writers want our work to do, which is it got me to stop and to think. And the stopping part of it was as important as the thinking part of it. As I continued and to, to read and, and, and do things, I noticed that there were kind of changes in my own pattern of behavior and thought that were really kind of interesting. Um, Whenever I read about wisdom and its definition, I found myself sort of arguing with the uh, definition, troubleshooting the def definition, disputing the definition, but at the same time being illuminated by that kind of uh, disagreement and, and just thinking about uh, not only wisdom, but then how it kind of uh, resonated with the decisions that I made in my own life, uh, the kind of choices I made, that sort of thing. In a funny sense, the definition of wisdom began not even to matter too much. It's important, obviously, scientifically, but um, Sternberg made the point that to understand wisdom fully and correctly probably requires more wisdom than any of us have. So there's an understanding that that whatever we're talking about is difficult to get our arms around, uh, but I don't think that means that it's not worth thinking about or not even worth trying to define. But we 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 we're, we gravitate towards certain um, qualities. Um, now, granted that wisdom is almost. Uh, impossible def to define. And that book I mentioned that came out in 1990 by the psychologists um, had 13 chapters written by 13 different groups of psychologists, and every chapter had a different definition of, of wisdom. <laughs> and it just sort of indicates the kind of, there, there's no definitional consensus in many ways about what actually it is. Um, but... Uh, and this is what uh, the, another sort of part of this process. I began paying more attention to the convergences and the congruences in the definitions than I did about the differences. And there were things that were congruent across different definitions. Um, there were certain cognitive qualities and emotional traits that kept cropping up again and again uh, in these discussions, primarily in the psychological literature, but also in, this, in the philosophical literature. Things like being even keeled emotionally and how that sort of prepared you for decision making. Uh, an ability to frame problems in a way that allows you to see alternative solutions, an ability to understand the viewpoint of others, uh, an ability to weigh future rewards against uh, uh, immediate, the allure of immediate gratifications, a sense of moral and social justice, an ability to deal with limitation, uncertainty, and change. These qualities ran through a lot of uh, discussions of wisdom, whether it was in psychology, you know, and if you go back and look uh, in the early history of philosophy as well. And this kind of led to the second sort of major insight. Um, I knew that no one in neuroscience was seriously doing research in wisdom. But I realized that a lot of cutting-edge neuroscientific research was being done on precisely these cognitive and emotional qualities that I had kind of identified. Um, and in fact, psychologists, theologians, philosophers long before me had identified as being um, really important, if not central, to wisdom. And if I bring anything special to this whole enterprise, uh, 
I kind of have always had the dumb luck of being familiar with a lot of different fields that don't typically talk to each other. So I was able to see conversations that were in, in different fields that maybe they were not aware of. Uh, clearly, the neuroscience community was not aware of this wisdom literature. Uh, the, the wisdom community, the, the wisdom psychologists were actually not that aware of the neuroscience. Um, Neuroscience, interestingly, was becoming very conscious of some of the uh, very old arguments philosophically. Um, so they were beginning to pay attention. And one of the most interesting phenomena I've observed in the last five years in the scientific literature, very hardcore articles in Nature and Science about brain uh, neuroscience, is that the list of citations at the end of the article include people like Aristotle, uh, John Stuart Mills, John Rawls, um, uh, David Hume. In other words, th th these ancient conflicts that have been uh, identified and bandied about for centuries, if not millennia, uh, are being re-examined, readdressed, uh, and different experimental protocols are being designed to kind of test them in the, in the sort of atmosphere of brain science now, which is uh, in and of itself really interesting. So that got me to ask these questions. So, you know, can the workings of the brain help us to understand what it means to be wise and perhaps even suggest ways we can become wiser? Uh, is there any place for wisdom in our modern world? And of course, before answering those questions, I had to come to at least a tentative answer to another question, which is, again, what exactly is wisdom? Um, I'm not going to answer that too specifically, but I'm going to give you an example of how one comes kind of sideways into some of these issues. Um, uh, it's a question that has so many dimensions, uh, as I mentioned before, but also because the book actually runs through a number of working definitions and, um, you know, argues with them, uh, uh, announces them. And it's, I think part of the processing of wisdom is processing one's definition of it and thinking how it applies to you. And, and that's part of the process of this entire book. However, um, I really like the succinctness of a contemporary philosopher named Robert Nozick, who said, uh, wisdom is an understanding of what is important. And there's a lot of stuff that follows behind that very simple statement, how we determine valuation, how we value what's important, what's the, the ambit or environment of importance, um, how do we gather knowledge that reinforces what, what's important, and so on and so forth. But that, that simple uh, standard, I think, is really important. Uh, and that leads me to an episode in my own life with which I begin the book because it occurred to me much after the fact uh, that it was an exercise in deciding what was important, even though at the time I was actually not aware of it. So I'd just like to read the kind of beginning of the book as, uh, as an example of, of um, how our brain works, at least. Um, okay. On a, beautiful, on a beautiful fall morning nearly a decade ago, like hundreds of mornings before and since, I dropped off one of my children at school. Michaela, then five years old, had just started first grade, and the playground chatter among both the children and their parents reflected that mix of nervous unfamiliarity and comforting reconnection that marks the beginning of the school year. I lingered in the schoolyard until Michaela lined up with her teachers and classmates. She wore a pretty purple dress that my mother had just sent her, white socks, and pink and white checkered sneakers. A hairband exposed her hopeful, eager, beautiful face. I sneaked in a last hug, as impulsive dads are wont to do, before she disappeared into the building. The time was about 8.40 a.m. As I left the schoolyard and began to head toward the subway and home to Brooklyn, I heard a thunderous, unfamiliar roar overhead. As the noise grew louder and closer, I froze in an instinctive crouch, much like the rats we always read about in scientific experiments on fear. Wondering where the sound was coming from, knowing only that it was ominously out of the ordinary. Moments later, a huge shadow with metal wings passed directly over my head, like some prehistoric bird of prey. <clears throat> Excuse me. I instantly recognized it as a large, twin-engine commercial airliner, but nothing in my experience prepared me for what happened next. I watched for the endless one, two, three, four seconds it took for this shiny man-made bird excuse me, to fly directly into the tall building that I faced several blocks away. In real time, I watched a 395,000 pound airplane simply disappear. Almost immediately, 
Black smoke began to curl out of the cruel, grinning incision its wings had sliced in the facade of the skyscraper. In moments when life's regular playbook flies out the window, when the ground shifts beneath our feet in a literal or figurative earthquake, we feel a surge of adrenalized fear at the shock of the unexpected. But right behind that feeling comes the struggle to make sense of the seemingly senseless, to try to understand what has just happened and what it means so that we will know how to think about a future that suddenly seems uncertain and unpredictable. In truth, the future is always unpredictable, which is why these moments of shock remind us with unusual urgency that we have a constant, if often unconscious, need for wisdom too. Although we now know, we now all know exactly what happened that terrible morning, the ground truth in Lower Manhattan on the morning of September 11, 2001 was much fuzzier at 8.45 a.m. One of the hallmarks of wisdom, what distinguishes it so sharply from mere intelligence, is the ability to exercise good judgment in the face of imperfect knowledge. In short, do the right thing, ethically, socially, familiarly, personally. Sometimes, as on this day, we have to deliberate these decisions in the midst of an absolutely roaring neural stew of conscious and unconscious urgings. In one sense, I knew exactly what had happened long before the first news bulletin hit the airwaves. In a larger sense, someone watching television in Timbuktu soon knew vastly more about the big picture than I did. This may be an exaggerated example, but it is in precisely the murk of this kind of confusion that we often have to make decisions. So what did I do? I went to a nearby coffee shop and I bought a cup of coffee. It didn't occur to me until much later that this was a decision of sorts, perhaps a foolish one and certainly not an obvious one. But to the extent that I mustered, e <clears throat> excuse me, but to the extent that I mustered uh, even a dram of wisdom that day, it was in how I viewed the situation and what I thought was most important. Oddly, I felt little or no physical threat despite the such close proximity to the unfolding disaster. In some respects, <clears throat> the event played much scarier on TV than in person. My, person, my immediate focus even then was on the long-term psychological impact that such a calamity might have on a young child, meaning my daughter, and what, if anything, a parent might do to minimize it. I hadn't quite understood yet that that would be my mission for the day, but by standing in the street and sipping a cup of coffee in that mysterious shorthand of human choice, I had chosen to stay close to my daughter, to stay calm, and failing that, to fake parental calm realistically enough to convince her that this was a situation we could deal with. But she didn't need to see the whole movie. I did not think it was a good idea for a young child to witness, as I did, human bodies falling like paperweight angels from the upper floors of the nearby tower. Even more, I did not think it was a good idea for a young child to absorb, even for a moment, the panic and despair written on the faces of all the adults who were beginning to comprehend that the world that, as they had known it, even a few minutes earlier, had suddenly changed, slipping irrevocably out of their, however illusionary, controlling grasp. If you're thinking that I'm offering a smug little narrative about wise parenting, not to worry. Wisdom doesn't come easily to us mortals, and I've been reminded many times since that it probably didn't come to me that day either. Many of the choices that I made that morning were second guessed by my wife, by my friends, and even by my daughter. More to the point, my small-minded plan to buffer Michaela's emotional experience was rudely interrupted by the collapse of 500,000 tons of metal, concrete, and glass. Just as the teachers began to evacuate children from her school, the second tower came down, unleashing the kind of apocalyptic roar no child should ever have to hear and a huge pyroclastic cloud of debris came boiling up Greenwich Street toward us. You couldn't tell if the cloud was going to reach us or not, but it wasn't a moment of contemplation. I picked up Michaela and we joined a horde of people running up the street. As I carried her in my arms, swimming up river in a school of panicked fish, she was forced to look backward, downtown, right into the onrushing menace of our suddenly dark times. Even to this day, however, the thing Michaela remembers most about the evacuation is the moment her classmate, Liam, accidentally walked into a street sign when he wasn't looking. It will be a long time, if ever, before I know if I acted wisely on 
Indeed, it didn't even occur to me until I was writing this passage that the most important decision I made that day did not even rise to the level of conscious choice. I decided without any conspicuous deliberation that I had to be a parent first, not a journalist, on that particular morning. At one level, it was an obvious choice. At another, it went against self-interest, career, my professional identity, taking advantage of being an eyewitness to the biggest story of my lifetime. What was I thinking? That, in, in a sense, is what I want this book to be about. How do we make complex, complicated decisions and life choices, and what makes some of these choices so clearly wise that we all intuitively recognize them as a moment, however brief, of human wisdom? What goes on in our heads when we're struggling to be patient and prudent, and are there ways to enhance those qualities? When we're being foolish, on the other hand, do our brains make us do it? And how does the passage of time and our approaching mortality change our thought processes and perhaps make us more amenable to wisdom? In moments of exceptional challenge and uncertainty, we tend to ask, how did this happen? What could we have done to prevent this dire turn of events? This is another way of saying, I realize now, that we are always searching for wisdom, but all too often we are looking for it in the rearview uh, rear mirror sifting the past for clues to how we might have thought about the future in a different way. We crave wisdom, worship it in others, wish it upon our children, and seek it ourselves, precisely because it will help us lead a meaningful life as we count our days, because we hope it will guide our actions as we step cautiously into that always uncertain future. At times of challenge and uncertainty, nothing seems more important than wisdom, economic wisdom, moral wisdom, political wisdom, even that private behind closed doors wisdom that allows us to convey the gravity of changed circumstances to our children without making them afraid of change itself. Nothing seems more important, yet nothing seems more beyond our grasp until we begin to think about wisdom before we think we need it. So I wanted to read that as an example of, of the kind of decision making we sometimes make without being aware of it. Um, we're, not, we're unconscious of the process, uh, and there's been a lot of neuroscience in the last 10 or 15 years that's made clear that the emotional part of our brain is kind of telling us sometimes things to do and counseling our actions at a level that we're not even conscious of until later. Um, I would say that that counsel is not always wise, which is what uh, makes it kind of tricky and interesting, but nonetheless it's an, imp uh, an input to behavior and thought that I think is much more appreciated now than it used to be. Um, and it's also a, a kind of a reminder that I think we're always struggling to be wise and to do the right thing. But what's exactly going on inside our brains when we're doing this? And is there any reason to think we might possibly become wiser if we understand the neural underpinnings of wisdom? So I set out to see if I could attach any serious science uh, to, if not wisdom itself, to these qualities or traits that seemed important to the idea of wisdom as I was conducting this research. And the, my approach was the following. Um, as many of you probably know, the, the great power of modern science is something called reductionism. Uh, you basically take a big biological idea, for example, like heredity, and then you break it down into some component parts, which then you can approach experimentally and, and uh, design experiments about and hopefully get some answers to. Um, in a more metaphoric sense, uh, I took the same reductionist approach to, pro approach to wisdom. The idea itself is huge again, and, and it doesn't lend itself to easy de description. But I ask myself, are there some common elements in the definitions of wisdom that might be reducible? And is there any real science to these elements? I should say that when I started out doing this, I was hard pressed to find a single scientist who would say she or he was working on the neuroscience of wisdom, and for very good reason. Um, people wouldn't think you were a very good scientist if you attempted to measure a process that you could not even define. So it was not an active interest uh, of, of uh, any neuroscientist I talked to at the time. However, when you break wisdom down into some of its component parts, when you reduce it, um, which I did by kind of following the lead of the psychologists, um, I realized that there was a lot of interesting research. And I kind of organized it for the purposes of the book and somewhat arbitrarily uh, into what I call eight neural pillars of wisdom, kind of building off the, the classic seven uh, pillars of wisdom from the Bible. 
Uh, what exactly are these? Um, I'll run through them briefly and then talk about one of them in a little bit more, more detail. Uh, emotion regulation, by which is meant um, uh, an ability to respond to adversity, to negative events, negative emotion, and kind of reset your emotional thermostat in a way that you don't get sort of bogged down in the negativity. Uh, it's a way to respond. It's, a, it's basically a coping mechanism in terms of your emotional life and how you respond to things. Decision making and all the things that go into decision making, including gathering knowledge, uh, knowing what knowledge to include in your decision, what to not to include, uh, how you gather it, uh, where you go to get it, uh, where it accumulates through through the uh, lifetime experiences that we all have. Compassion, by which is meant not simply feeling for another person, but uh, taken almost to the level of a kind of mind reading uh, where you actually inhabit and understand another person's point of view in order to understand both what they're feeling, where they're coming from, and how that could inform a decision. Moral judgment and reasoning, uh, working through uh, problems that all of us encounter in, in a number of different settings uh, where we have to make choices that are difficult precisely because there are good re reasons to do either one. Um, patience by which is meant um, how do we uh, overcome the sort of impulse of impatience when it doesn't serve us well? How do we forestall immediate gratification in order to achieve a larger, uh, if more distant, in, uh, uh, goal in, in time? Um, humility, by which is, not, which is meant not simply being humble, but accepting limitation as part of one's um, uh, apparatus that you don't will not have the answers to everything, you will not be able to find the answers to everything, that sometimes you have to make decisions without uh, adequate information. And also, I think there's a, there's a component of humility in making one's uh, self available to new sources or forms of information that maybe uh, do did not, did not conform to what you expected or hoped, so that it's an openness to alternative forms of knowledge that might be helpful ultimately. Um, altruism, a really important component of what's now considered social neuroscience, actually. This idea of uh, sacrificing personal uh, uh, interest in the greater interest uh, and goals of a group. Um, sacrificing what you would want in order to promote the goals of this larger group, whether it's a family or, again, a company, whatever the group happens to be. And this really important ability to cope with uncertainty and change. How do, you know, the world is not static. The environment is not static. It changes all the time. Um, are we upset by change or how do we adapt to it? I hope you can see that each one of these traits is not an island virtue unto itself, um, but rather that they feed into and resonate with each other. So that being emotionally even keeled affects the kind of decisions that you make. Uh, and compassion is not merely feeling for someone else, as I said, but somehow inhabiting and understanding the point of view of another person, which again, in turn, informs your decisions and the decisions you take. So I set out to see if I could find any interesting brain science attached to these components of wisdom and to see if the researchers were willing to talk about wisdom, which in some cases, surprisingly, they were. Um, but I'll give you one of many examples of these neural pillars of wisdom, if you'll indulge another passage uh, from, the, from the book. In part, I heard that someone at, at Google was encouraging compassion meditation, so it was one of the reasons I wanted to, uh, to read this. Um, um, let me I give you a little brief introduction to this passage. So one of the fundamental uh, cornerstones of wisdom has always been compassion, and it's, it's a, a, a central concept that runs through Confucianism, Buddhism, the Judaic uh, Christian tradition. Um, the particle physicist Victor Weisskopf uh, famously once said, knowledge without compassion is inhuman, compassion without knowledge is ineffective. Uh, that's kind of an epigrammatic intersection of compassion and science, but there's also a real intersection of compassion and science. Um, for more than a decade, Richard Davidson, who's a neuroscientist at the University of Wisconsin, has been flying in Buddhist monks to Madison to do brain experiments. He measures electrical activity in the brain while they meditate or lie in an MRI machine. Mathieu Ricard is a French-born Buddhist monk who has participated in a half dozen of these experiments uh, on compassion over the last decade. And I'd like to describe just a bit of his visit uh, on one of these occasions. So at exactly 8.48 on an unseasonably brisk overcast June morning in Madison, 
With a hint of rain in the air, Mathieu Ricard climbed out of a Subaru Outback station wagon driven by his friend Richard J. Davidson, license plate emote, adjusted his saffron and purple robes over bare arms, and then sauntered into the Wasteman Center of Neuroscience for an arduous day of meditation. Over the previous few days, Ricard, a French-born Buddhist monk who lives in a monastery in Kathmandu, had flown from New Delhi to Newark, led a, led a meditation workshop for financiers from a Manhattan stock brokerage firm at the Harvard Club, discussed a new book project, and then traveled to Wisconsin, where he has participated in experiments since the year 2000. As he walked down a long corridor, he paused to hug old friends. He has come to Madison half a dozen times for these experiments and greet people he'd never met before, including a bemused maintenance worker holding a paintbrush. Within a few minutes, he had slipped out of his topsiders and settled his 62-year-old frame onto a green pillow on the floor of a small, dark, nominally soundproofed booth. Then scientists attached a hairnet of 128 in electroencephalograph or EEG electrodes to his shaven skull. Each electrode would measure electrical activity in this, in this Buddhist brain as it meditated, capturing any changes in milliseconds, while nearby computer monitors would provide a running display of the readings. Neuroscientists prefer EEG to MRI in certain situations uh, or certain experiments uh, because of the technique captures instantaneous changes better than, uh, than uh, MRI. Uh, C'est bien, Mathieu, asked Antoine Lutz, the French-born scientist leading the experiment. Uh, okay, Ricard replied. With that, the heavy door was closed and the experiment began. We have found a correlation between a deep state of meditation and change in the EEG activity of the brain, explained Lutz, who published his first monk data in a 2004 article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a uh, leading international journal. That study reported that expert meditators who generated a state of, quote, unconditional loving kindness and compassion, end quote, uh, which I like to point out is a phrase that you do not normally encounter in the scientific literature. <laughs> uh, it, it, you now see it in, in places like science and nature. Um, uh, expert meditators who generated a state of, quote, unconditional loving kindness and compassion produced accompanying changes in the brain, especially something called gamma ops oscillations, gamma band oscillations, about which more in a moment. Now they are gathering more data and asking um, uh, expert meditators like Ricard to estimate the intensity of their mental states on a scale from one to nine as their brain waves are being recorded. Nearly an hour into the experiment, after segments devoted to, the fo to focused attention and open presence meditation, the voice of researcher Andy Francis was piped into the little room. The next one will be compassion, he said. According to the experimental plan, Ricard would spend the first minute in neutral, not meditating at all, to provide a baseline of brain activity. After a pause of exactly 60 seconds, Francis leaned toward his microphone and said in a flat, neutral voice, compassion, compassion. At a scientific seminar in New York several months earlier, uh, Richie Davidson had made the point that expert meditators could turn it on like that, and which he indicated by snapping his fingers. And although Ricard's compassion meditation was not as instantaneous as snap fingers, it would probably strike most people as impressively quick. After 15 seconds, he rated his meditative state at two. By 30 seconds, he was up to three. By 39 seconds, he was up to four. He reached five at the one minute mark and achieved a lofty seven at two minutes. These are self-reported ratings, of course, and deserving of every bit of skepticism that self-reports inevitably invite. But since dedicating his life to the practice of Buddhism in 1972, which is literally the day after he received a PhD in molecular biology in the Paris laboratory of Nobel laureate Francois Jacob, Ricard has logged well over 10,000 hours of meditation. And I couldn't avoid the sense that I was watching a powerful neural engine rev up, roar, and accelerate like a race car, cognitively going from zero to 60 in the figurative snap of a finger. As Ricard's meditative state deepened, the EEG readings scrawling across Andy Francis's computer screen visibly changed. At the beginning, they had been a series of thin, disorganized lines, the electrophysiological equivalent of lank, unkempt hair. By the time Ricard reached a self-assessed eight, about seven minutes into his compassion meditation, 
The EEG readings had an intensity of amplitude looking like bushy eyebrows and an overall coherence and synchronicity that were apparent even to my novice eye. With a few practitioners, Francis confirmed, you can see the change in the raw data in real time when you say meditate, but that's very rare. At the risk of sounding credulous, if not downright corny, the electrical activity measured by dozens of electrodes plastered all over Ricard's noggin seemed in remarkable harmony. Then the muffled sound of a toilet flushing in a nearby bathroom could be heard, and whether this perturbed Ricard's meditative state or not, his subjective ratings began to drop. Later on in his office, Davidson agreed that the coherence and synchrony of these brain waves was so striking that it was obvious even to non-experts. It doesn't require any fancy computer interpretation, he said. You can actually see it with the naked eye, it's so pronounced. His current thinking, pure conjecture at this point, he conceded, is that the pattern of brain activity observed during meditation, known as a gamma oscillation, might be a way for monks to coordinate activity in multiple parts of the brain while experiencing intense compassion. What is striking about the gamma, Davidson said, is the synchrony across brain regions that we see. From their own descriptions, it's kind of a panoramic awareness that's fused with compassion. But the elements of the panoramic awareness suggest that there are many different systems in the brain that become functionally integrated, which may be a neural correlate of this experience of a panoramic awareness or vast awareness. A study by the Wisconsin Group published in 2008 in the journal Public Library of Science One reported that fMRI studies of monks and also novices who followed a two-week program of compassion meditation written by Ricard showed increased activity during compassion meditation uh, in several distinct parts of the brain. Um, Ricard emerged from the chamber in Madison looking fresh and energetic after the morning's experiments, and he said, you have to come to a lab to do meditation these days, he said with a chuckle, wiping his face with a towel. Um, to kind of wrap up and kind of cut to the chase, um, each of the middle chapters of the book talks about one or another of these neural properties associated with wisdom. Um, and, and just to summarize very quickly, there is a neuroscience of moral judgment. There is a neuroscience of emotion regulation. There is a neuroscience of altruism now. There is a neuroscience of decision making, including decisions in the face of uncertainty. And there is a neuroscience of delayed gratification. And to cut even further to the chase, when I started out pursuing this hypothesis and began this book back in 2007, there was no neuroscience of wisdom. A month after I turned in a draft of the book, uh, a review article appeared in the journal Archives of General Psychiatry, which is a peer-reviewed journal, uh, and the title of that article was A Neurobiology of Wisdom. Um, it's not mainstream science at this point, but it's part of a conversation that it was not part of uh, even uh, two years ago. Um, so at this point, I'd like to take any questions you might have. and uh, Yeah, we'll take questions into the microphone, but uh, let's first give Stephen a, a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, if we do run out of time, he'll sure he'll be hanging out a little bit afterwards to talk more or uh, sign books if necessary. So again, use the mic if you have a question. Uh, I'll start it out. Um, you know, wisdom, much like consciousness in the mind, uh, for you know millennia, has been considered kind of separate from the biological processes. And I know uh, neuroscience and neurobiology tend to really want to stitch those two strongly together and remove any kind of intangible higher mind. Uh, did you were any of those uh, preconceived notions you might have had broken or reinforced or just changed as you started to study this? Did you actually believe in a distinct mind before, or do you more or less now? I'm, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I guess I have two answers. As a humanist, my answer is I think wisdom is too big to, uh, you know, for science to entirely wrap its arms around. As someone who's written about science for 30 years, um, I've constantly been surprised at how a reductive and molecular nuts and bolts, nuts and bolts approach to issues has really changed our thinking about how things work and how the, even the mind functions. So, um, uh, I guess I'll have an agnostic response in the sense that uh, part of me thinks it's going to be uh, impossible ultimately to explain everything about wisdom. I've been constantly surprised by the ability of science to explain things. And I think uh, it, neuroscience, again, is a field at the be beginning of the story, not at the end. Um, 
Um, thanks very much for the talk. I, uh, my, the qu one of the things I thought of right away was that um, the eight pillars seem to talk mostly about the abilities to process information and things like that. What about just the amount of information? So kind of the size of the database for someone who is wise, right? Uh -huh. uh, I think one way you can think about that is that uh, as long as your memory is functioning well, uh, you're building up a, a database of lifetime experience, which is telling you, for example, things about human nature as well as a sort of uh, factual knowledge base. Uh, and as long as you have the ability to recall all that degree of information and such it's a very situational one of the things about wisdom that's interesting is that uh, what's a wise decision in one situation or context will be foolish in another because it, it needs it's very contextual um, which is why it doesn't I, I don't think it kind of fits any kind of algorithmic uh, a notion of arriving at a right decision it really depends on, on the the context and the environment now when you think about this from a biological point of view um, our environment is never static. And so um, it was a good idea to design a brain that was very flexible and adaptive to change because that's the environment that we all live in and that, in fact, all biological creatures live in. Uh, and this is such a powerful instrument. Uh, I, I think wisdom is kind of, uh, in part, being adaptive and discerning enough to see when a t situation is changing or about to change and then being adaptive to what that change means and how you respond to it. So our brains are, are not built uh, necessarily for habit. Um, there's been some interesting experiments that, you know, habit obviously is when you have the right solution to the same problem that always comes up, you, you do it quicker and more efficiently. Uh, but when the situation changes, habit is ingrained to the point where peop, uh, animals, at least in experiments that are, have uh, ha a habitual response to something, have a harder time finding a different solution. So you get ingrained by habit and that actually impedes your ability to find alternative solutions neurologically in animals in a certain set of experiments. You, you actually pretty early on in the book uncouple wisdom from intelligence, which I think was what that question was kind of hitting at, hinting at is like how how many facts and how many things do you know? It's very different from wisdom, and and you place wisdom within fairly easy reach of um, of the common person. I mean, it, like some to a certain part, you were talking a lot of to like, well, just give it time. Most of us will be much wiser, even if we're not wise when we're old. Um, and some people, you know, uh, wise beyond their years, what have you. But um, it didn't. It certainly took away any sort of elitist connotations that one might have had when you think of someone who's just very intelligent, mm -hmm. and and you kind of put wisdom kind of in, back in. It was almost describing like a folksy sort of wisdom, which I don't necessarily know if I agree with the things that neuroscientists or that you had laid out as like, sure, those are necessary but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, can you talk about what influenced that approach and if there was kind of a sort of a populist. Uh, feel about it intentionally, or if you just really wanted to throw it out there, like you heard it. I wouldn't call it populist, but I would say I would put it, uh, frame it this way: um, so much of intelligence is related to, or it has traditionally been related to cognition, obviously, and so the, the sort of the cognitive part of neuroscience has been uh, f focused on intelligence. The whole. Um, aspect of emotional intelligence has really been something that's, again, the last 20 years or so. Um, this idea that there's other inputs, other for forms of knowledge and so forth. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with negotiating the sort of everyday dilemmas that people encounter. And I think when people think about wisdom or even Solomonic wisdom, the classic biblical story about Solomon, um, you know, it's resolving this very immediate uh, dilemma in a very particular situation. How do you do it? Um, and, and so I think this emotional intelligence, this idea of emotional intelligence, uh, this attentiveness to what emotion is doing in terms of decision making and gathering information and so on is part of, uh, I think, of what you're talking about. It's something that everybody, it doesn't require uh, book learning. It's more a, a, a learning a kind of, a, again, the control of this emotional thermostat in a way, which I think can be controlled with, with, uh, with use. I mean, the, 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 the big, um, take home message from neuroscience in the last 10 or 15 years is this notion of plasticity that things change um, the brain changes on the basis of experience or what you do uh, and even how you exert yourself and these uh, meditation experiments are important because it shows that the brain is changing when you're doing this repetitive mental exercise or making this mental exertion um, 
I think what that suggests is that even at the level of this um, um, emotional content, that this can be um, uh, at least modulated. I think we can learn to, you know, deal with it at a certain level, uh, modulate it, reduce the the impact of negative uh, events or adversity uh, through this kind of concentrated practice. And I really think of it as, you know, if the 20th century, 20th century was a lot about, you know, physical exertion and, f- and maintaining muscle tone in terms of keeping ourselves fit, I think the 21st century is going to be about maintaining our mental tone by uh, mental exertion and ter- really training our brains in terms terms of dealing with some of these things. We're not there yet, I would hasten to add, <laughs> clearly, but I think it's really important. All right, well, uh, since we are just about out of time, I'll finish with one last question, unless someone else has, has one they want to toss out there. Um, so it's kind of a cap off, and again, you can always uh, approach Stephen after the talk. To cap it all off, uh, it, it actually makes it, you make it sound as if, um, you know, again, wisdom, the traits of wisdom could at least, if not be learned, you can frame them in your mind in such a way as to kind of work faster towards that unattainable goal of, of absolute wisdom mm-hmm. and put yourself a little farther down the road a little earlier on in your life. Uh, is that a corrective interpretation that you actually could learn certain aspects of wisdom or train your body to, to be ready for it? And if so, any quick tips for, uh, for you to <laughs> let it go? You know, everyone, I, I, I'm always forced into saying I don't write self-help books. So, I, so I'm very wary of be, making prescriptions. Uh, I think one of the things you're alluding to, there's uh, a discussion with this whole issue of emotional um uh, uh, regulation. Where does that come from? Where does it originate? And I talk about some uh, experimentation in the book uh, that suggests that maybe an early moderate exposure to adversity or stress acts as a form of, of uh, vaccination or inoculation uh, where it, it seems to enable, at least in animal experiments, uh, it seems to enable these animals to deal, deal with frustration and difficult circumstances later on and in, in, indeed uh, in, enhance their problem solving, uh, abilities and, and these very specific tasks that they use in these experiments. Um, I'm certainly not suggesting that the children should be deliberately placed in, absur- uh, you know, adverse circumstances as a way of tuning this tissue, but I think it's something to be mindful of. Uh, there's a, there's a history, um, in terms of the major figures of both philosophy and, and religion, uh, of, um, early life adversity and people like Aristotle had a speech impediment was orphaned uh, Moses had a speech impediment um, the Buddha at least according to some accounts lost his mother when he was seven days old um, uh, and th- through a number of other uh, schools of philosophy, Confucius lost his mother when, or father when he was three. Uh, Abraham Lincoln lost his mother when he was nine. In other words, they, these are, uh, uh, and a number of uh, founders of philosophy were raised in what we would call single parent homes now. So there's this kind of thread of at early life adversity that may uh, uh, contribute to this. I don't think we know enough to really arrive at any kind of uh, prescription for it. Having said that, the the most interesting exercise that I got out of this whole thing was the more I thought about and wrote about wisdom, the more I just started asking myself, well, what would be the wise thing to do here when any kind of problem came up? And as a kind of, you know, it's really kind of a armchair mantra or, you know, amateur mantra, but by asking myself that question, by stopping myself long enough to, to ask the question and begin to think of what the possible answers might be, um, I found that a really useful exercise and I think uh, everyone could benefit from. And you don't need a prescription. <laughs> Well, once again, uh, thanks, Stephen, so much for stopping by the San Francisco office. One more round of applause. Thank you very much.